G'day everyone, welcome back. Today I'm wanting to talk about some of the myths around the Crusades. For so long we've seen crusades um, portrayed on the on the big screen movies, the Hollywood blockbusters, the small screen uh, and, and this kind of thing and throughout books it's inspired imagination. And unfortunately um, we've seen a great deal of misconception and misunderstanding that's kind of developed over the last sort of at least hundred or so years and today people have terrible misconceptions around the Crusades, what were the motives, what were the outcomes, and what were the legacies. And a lot of people really don't understand this. Now that's okay, but I, I think um, some of this kind of misunderstanding has led to some terrible emotional responses around the Crusades. So I really want to get into some of the myths today around the Crusades and kind of debunk a lot of that stuff. So let's have a look at debunking some of the myths of the Crusades. Righto guys, I've got some notes written down. I'd really like to be able to refer to them. Let's take a look at debunking a few myths around the Crusades. A lot of people see the Crusades as being um, an, an unjust and violent action by, by Christians against Muslims and minority groups. And this is absolutely not true. Um, I don't think at any point really during the Crusading era was there, um, did the Crusaders even outnumber the Muslims? Um, and it certainly wasn't an anti-Muslim kind of affair. In fact, if you look at the definition of a crusade, it was about retaking Christian lands and creating safe passage for Christian pilgrims to and from the Holy Land as much as anything. And there also had to be um, a war that was sanctioned by the Pope. In fact, one of the big um, factors that came into causing the crusades or bringing the crusades about was in fact the destruction uh, of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre uh, by the Egyptian Caliph. Uh, it was um, an absolutely unjust thing to do. It made no sense. It certainly wasn't a political or, or um, kind of strategic advantage to destroy such a, a place of Christian worship. And it was um, just one of those terrible things that's kind of occurred in war, which has no meaning, has no understanding. Um, the, the second myth I want to look at is the, the myth around um, which sun typically went on crusade. A lot of people think it was the second, third or fourth sun. Um, obviously, uh, many Christian nobles had as many sons as they could to ensure uh, the ongoing heritage of their family. But actually, if you look at it, it was much uh, the, the first sons that went, if you look at the registrars, um, and particularly people like Jonathan Riley Smith have done some fantastic research into this, and I highly recommend his books. The first sons, interestingly, actually had by far the most to lose. Now, if you look at how um, the inheritance structure tended to work in medieval Europe, you would see that the first son... Uh, or the eldest surviving son would um, inherit the, by far the most and the younger sons typically inherited next to nothing or nothing at all. Um, so the first son had the most to lose and it's interesting because um, I, I, think, I think there were some very honourable reasons that the first sons tended to go. They were um, very much about people like people are today. They're about the injustice that they saw taking place and the um, the horrors of conflict that they had seen, the persecution of um, Christian pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land and these first sons were able to do something about it 
it was in fact the first sons who were going on the Crusades, and, and this is interesting because they would have um, used up so much of their money to get there. You have to understand that to get from Western Europe to the Middle East at the time could quite easily take one or two years, and so there's a great deal of equipment that would have to be purchased to go on campaign. Not only that, but you're talking about all the logistics of being able to get yourself to the Middle East with your horses, with your weapons and knights, uh, and men at arms and so on. Um, and some people, in fact, went on campaign with their entire families. Myth two, um, honorable reasons, the reasons for the Crusades. So if we look at this, um, we see a lot of people thinking that it was about plunder and, and making yourself rich and all this kind of thing. That's just a load of nonsense. Um, very few Christians actually ever made it back from the Crusades intact. Most came back maimed um, or completely disabled. Most came back broke financially and ruined um, because they'd spent so much of their, their money uh, on, the, on the Crusades and had, had really just run out of resources. I think the reasons for going on Crusade are very much the same kind of reasons that you see people um, joining the police force or joining the military today. It's about protecting people who can't protect themselves. Um, and that's certainly the reason I think I, I joined the military. Um, it was very passionate and perhaps idealistic uh, when I joined all the way back when I was about 17 years old. Radio. Um, People's Crusade. Not long after um, the Council of Clermont, um, there was what was called the People's Crusade. And we believe there's a really no account of this in terms of um, who or, or numbers or anything like that. Whereas today, um, on a military campaign, you know exactly who's gone. You know their, their military numbers and their, the, the exact numbers of which skill set each different people have. Um, when they when they board a ship to to wherever it is that they're going to go, whereas back in the Middle uh, Ages that just wasn't a thing, and people joined and left the Crusade as they went, um, and they would have had absolutely no idea how to get to the Middle East. Really, um, they would have had no, very little sort of planning or preparation um, that would have gone into it. So the People's Crusade was led by a very fascinating character called Peter the Hermit um, and we'll try and do a video on him you know, perhaps in a few weeks time. The People's Crusade we think probably started off with around about 70 or 80 thousand people um, uh, and they were largely massacred in a place called Nasia um, because they had gone on crusade and they, and they, they didn't have um, the proper weapons and equipment. They didn't have um, the right horses and all of the logistics chain that you would you would see in much later crusades. The next um, next myth I'd really like to look at is what did it mean by marked by the cross? So a lot of crusaders are seen as having a cross such as this emblazoned on their chest. Um, this is probably not very historically accurate. Although this tunic actually, it's not far off. Um, this is a lovely coarse linen, which would be historically accurate. Uh, it, it is machine sewn, it was commercially made, but um, then the red cross is made out of, uh, again, a coarse linen. In fact, it w historically it would have been positioned over my heart and would have been maybe a quarter of the size. But otherwise, this is not too bad. What did it mean to be marked by the cross? Well, I guess... Um, it was a, there was no formal dress code as such. There was no formal uniform, particularly in the earlier Crusades. That was something that kind of started to develop um, throughout those kind of hundreds of years of the Crusading era. But certainly in the time of the First Crusade, um, I think if you go back to Marked by the Cross, this was to symbolize their promise to. Um, the, the church and to everybody else they're kind of um, invested in the cause and this was what they were going to do they were going to hold themselves as a collective to account now I understand I'm wearing a tunic which is uh, in line with with the Knights Templar and we'll go on to those people 
um, in some other videos in probably about a month's time, but we'll see. Alrighty, oh, next myth. This vault basically means God wills it. Crusades were not about slaughter. Crusades were not about just killing innocent people. Crusades were not about um, uh, the slaughter of, of Muslims or any other culture. Um, it, and I, I, I know that obviously slaughters did take place. And then part of that was that was just the medieval way. Um, and that was understood predating Roman times. But I'm talking about sort of God wills it. So this was about Christians doing how they interpreted God's will and how it was proclaimed to them um, through priests from the Pope. So it's not about going into mindless slaughter, as you might think, and as is often portrayed on the, on the big screen. It's much more about, um, as I say, protecting people who can't protect themselves. Next myth, uh, Crusaders at the time did not refer to themselves as Crusaders. Um, that is a term that seems to have come in sort of much later. Um, Crusaders would have referred to themselves really as um, Cruz de Santé. Now, I apologise, I'm butchering the French language there, and I, I, I know some of you are going to pick me up on it. Uh, the next myth I want to talk about is just war. So, a theologian called Augustine, in roughly the 4th century AD, talked about a just war. Let's put that down for a second. Radio, just war. What is a just war? Well, this needed to be a, a war that was decreed by a king or a noble or a priest or a, or a bishop, someone in high authority, um, and wasn't just about going to war with your neighbours. Remember, 4th century AD, outside the Roman Empire, armies were very, very small. Uh, and, and this is really why I think um, the Roman army was so successful in being able to push back um, the Germanic tribes or the Britons and those kind of people because there really wasn't anything capable of standing up to them. Gone off at a slight tangent there. Whoops. Um, Alrighty, let's go back to just war. The concept of a just war and what that meant in terms of how you treat uh, enemy combatants, civilians, um, places of worship, important buildings and all of this kind of thing. This was all kind of discussed by Augustine um, and it was a concept that was developed throughout the ages and right up into you know um, more modern times it's become things like um, the laws of armed conflict, the Geneva Convention and so on and so forth. Um, the concept I think that, that Augustine was trying to put forward is it is okay to defend yourself and it is okay um, to, to protect yourself but um, there is a difference between defending and simply going forth and annihilating an enemy and I think this can be seen with Christians um, more so than perhaps some other armies. Now I know this is going to be a bit of a a contentious point here uh, and I am kind of ready for it with the um, comment section below but what I'm trying to say is um, take on people like Alfred the Great for instance and Alfred the Great was able to show incredible mercy um, to the Vikings when he defeated them and in fact um, you know stopped the slaughter uh, and that kind of thing and so did uh, another Saxon king Harold Godwinson um, he called a halt to the slaughter at Stamford Bridge. So um, I, I realise there's only a few examples there, but I don't really want to go into the whole of you know medieval European history. This video might go on for quite a while if I did. But I guess what I'm trying to demonstrate there is um, certainly if we look at the history here, uh, and unfortunately history is never recorded as well as perhaps in, in, in the light of today we'd like it to be. We're now in obviously the... Um, 21st century and history was not written at the time for people looking back from the 21st century. History was written to celebrate the victories and the, the victors and that kind of thing and, um, and there we go. Radio. Next myth. Women in the Crusades. 
Now, there's a, been a great myth out there that uh, women were not involved in the Crusades, and if they were, that they were kept very much in their kind of gender-based roles. False. Now, I'd like to talk about three women in particular who um, are, are well known in, in history. The first being um, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Okay, uh, amazing lady, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, you know, the it girl of her day kind of thing. A very much a, um, a commander of fashion, but also uh, um, an extraordinary political strategist. What's very interesting about Eleanor is that she negotiated on equal terms with her, um, I guess, if you like, the enemy. Um, and she was very much the, str the strategist and the tactician. She certainly seems to have been involved in some levels of defensiveness in, of cities in terms of planning defensiveness. Um, she certainly seems to have been involved in um, negotiating treaties and also um, the release of hostages. So she's very much, um, you know, super high ranking person, became Queen of England, that kind of thing. But um, an extraordinary woman, uh, absolutely. The next one is uh, Florentine of Burgundy. She was the wife of Sven the Crusader uh, during the First Crusade. And Sven had returned to Europe to try and raise more troops. My understanding, um, and this is very sort of poorly recorded in history, but Sven had raised around about, if I'm right, um, one and a half thousand knights. And he had got back into the Middle East with these knights. Presumably, most of them would have come with squires, some of them with pages, um, and... There also was families with them too, um, but they were cut off by Seljuk Turks and Sven and Florentine uh, both died in that attack. Florentine is recorded in history as having been an active part of that defence. We really don't know very much about it, but we do, it's, it's certainly recorded that she was part of that fighting. So um, uh, as far as I can, you know, see her as being very much a crusader in her own right. Now the last one is um, that I'm going to talk about today is Ida Fombach. I don't know too much about pronouncing her name, but she is known for having led her own uh, forces against the Muslims. It's not recorded very well as to how much combat she was involved in. Personally, it is known that she was involved in combat and she did personally lead troops um, and lead patrols and that kind of thing. So, um, realistically, uh, is she a female knight? Quite possibly. Um, very, very interesting person. I'm going to do a lot more research on her uh, over the coming months and I'd love to do some, some more uh, videos on her and go into some of these people and more um, about women of the Crusades because I think it's a fantastic topic which is just about never covered by anybody else. Alrighty, the last thing I'm going to talk about is the, the massacre of Jerusalem. When the, during the First Crusade, the Crusaders retook Jerusalem. Key moment of the Crusades. Uh, in fact, of the whole Crusading era was the retaking of Jerusalem. Jerusalem obviously having been a, a Christian city previously. Now, there's a lot of people that talk about the great slaughter that then occurred. And um, to put that into context... In medieval times, it was just understood that if a, a siege would occur outside a city and the commanders of each side would meet and they would discuss terms and go away. Now, if the people inside the city decided to resist um, and fight on, and if they were to lose the battle, then what could occur is the, the winning side, the attackers, essentially had three days of carte blanche and could take what they wanted, slaughter who they wanted, that kind of thing. Now, that's not really the way it worked. Um, that's the way it's portrayed in history, but it's, it's actually a load of crap. Um, many people would be worth money as hostages, and that was simply the way it worked in the medieval period. 
you took hostages um, and then you bartered those hostages back to their families um, for a sum of money. A great example of that was when um, you know Richard I was taken prisoner and it took a long while to raise raise money. We'll talk about ransoms in another video another day but the point here is people were worth money and they were worth far more money alive than they were dead. So it's in everybody's interest to minimize that slaughter. In terms of pillaging, um, look, you have to understand during the heat of battle, um, people don't always follow the rules uh, and people don't always listen. That's just part of human nature. Uh, and that happens on the battlefield and it happens off the battlefield. It happens with soldiers and with every other aspect of society, even today. Um, people don't always follow the rules. That's why we have you know, red light cameras and speed cameras and drug tests and all that kind of thing. That's why we have rules. I think um, where people have deviated from the Pope's plan and where people have deviated from the, the mission of the crusade is where things have gone wrong. Um, now, did that slaughter take place? Some people talk about there being a lake of blood in Jerusalem that was kind of like, you know, knee deep. A load of crap. Um, Jerusalem's in a desert. The sand is very porous. Um, no one can create a flood in Jerusalem. It's just not going to happen. So, look, um, was there a slaughter? Absolutely. Um, but would that slaughter have been as big as perhaps it's often portrayed? No, I don't think it would have been. Right, guys, I really hope you've got something out of today. Uh, I, I really have enjoyed looking at some of the myths of the Crusades. Um, please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video. Please leave a comment below. I'm really interested in your thoughts on today's video. What are your myths and how do you think that I've approached them? Really love to hear your, your messages. Right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.